So uh, welcome uh, everyone uh, to this uh, start of this parallel session, which is about uh, green energy and especially uh, materials for energy storage. So this session we have three speakers and me as the chair. Uh, my name is Patrick Johansson, I'm a professor at uh, Chalmers University of Technology. And we will stretch with the speakers, we will stretch uh, uh, out into Europe, we'll be also in Swedish industry, uh, and we will also be uh, partly also in Swedish and, and in French, uh, 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 battery and supercapacitor uh, research based on materials advances. Uh, so first out, uh, Professor Christina Edström, a long-term friend of mine, and since uh, more than 20 years leading uh, the battery research at Uppsala University, uh, but also uh, leading Battery 2030 Plus, uh, the European uh, battery uh, effort, or one of the big battery European efforts. So without much further ado, Christina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this nice in introduction and for inviting me here. I will talk a little bit broadly about material science at the heart of European battery landscape, because it's really it's based on bat uh, materials, good batteries, the batteries of the future, it's all about materials, and of course combining materials. And as, as uh, Patrick said, I am from the Uppsala University Onstrom Advanced Battery Center, and this is just to show that I have some kind of 40-year experience in this field, and the uh, stamp collection, you see that is typical for a Swedish scientist, where you have to go to many funding agencies to get funding to have a big group. So it's, uh, that's how it is. Um, but I think what we're doing now from, from Sweden and from Europe and trying to collaborate in this battery field is very interesting. So I'm coming from the research side and I, I would like to point out uh, a few things that we have uh, to, to consider in, in Europe and that, that's of course the ecosystem globally. And this is from a uh, bibliometric report we made uh, for 20 th Battery 2030 Plus, which is a large-scale research initiative. It's actually one of the four flagships at the end of August this year, now, just like the Graphene, the Human Brain Project, and the Quantum Technologies. Uh, but from 1st of September, we will be not a flagship uh, at all in any communication. We'll be a large-scale research initiative, which we are in Frischli. But what this says is that now, since 2018, <coughs> the big volumes of uh, research publications coming from China. And US is actually on second place. But we see that we have some strongholds in, of course, in, the, um, in Europe as well. Um, and if we group them together, we'll we still be, we will be in the, the area of, of uh, United States actually but we are, we are not as large as all as China. I also think it's very interesting coming from Sweden that we seem to publish in a very oriented way towards um, the Asia, uh, with an exception of France. <laughs> and then we, we uh, in Europe, there is a lot more of collaboration. We need to be better to move into the European projects. And I hope that this what we are doing now to shape a European battery landscape is helping that. So, but I want to start with this, that, uh, what, the different kinds of initiatives we have. Because very late, the European Commission started 2017 realizing we need to do something. But, bottom up, the scientific community knew long before that, that we needed to do something, that we needed to collaborate. So the Alistair, ERI was formed during the six framework program and it's coordinated for CNRS in France, but we have several actors all around Europe being part of this network. And I think that has been a very important prerequisite for the work we, have, we are doing with the different initiatives today. Uh, so uh, 2017 European Battery Alliance was formed. That is to really push industry so they put industries together from the whole value chain of batteries. They have more than 700 organizations, part of what they are doing now. And uh, very, uh, as a complement to that, the European Commission, DigiConnect and DDRTD wanted 
uh, a, a large scale, long term, disruptive driven battery research program, which is Battery 2030 Plus. And after that, they realized we need an ETIP, and that was DGR Energy that said we need something that is building up the community and build roadmaps and, in, along the whole value chain, which any, any organization could uh, go, go and, uh, and work within for free. It doesn't cost you anything. And then in Horizon Europe, uh, the partnership program started, and there's a partnership of for batteries, where the Commission puts about 925 million uh, euros, and uh, here we negotiate the uh, calls for the future uh, EU calls on batteries. And it's very much all these initiatives here, especially Battery 2030 Plus and, and the BEPA, is very much on the material sides of the production. Because if you go to uh, applications, which is covered by Batteries Europe 2 and system integration of batteries, it's also other partnerships coming in, but these are therefore the important ones. And I also want to uh, point out that in this area especially, there's a lot of focus on education and skills. Reskilling, uh, blue color workers, but also excellent uh, educations which bring in competencies to Europe. And Again, because Alistair was early, we have had a master program in Europe for quite a long time, producing a lot of good people for us here in Europe and for, of course, the global scene as well. Uh, so the new initiatives coming up here have come quite late, just like these initiatives have come quite late. But we haven't been without initiatives before this. So this uh, value circle, I talked about it earlier, it, you know, we have worked so much linearly, so we need to work more circular. And uh, it's, it's uh, materials, battery materials, it's all from uh, mining precursors to make electromaterials, electrolytes, etc., and then, and then make them into electrodes and go to cell concepts, and then you have the cell manufacturing. But we should not forget the battery system and system integration research. And that, there is materials here too, of course, and we have recycling as part of it. So materials are everywhere, even if the, uh, the battery partnership and battery 2030 plus is more like here than the other ones. And when you think about batteries, there is actually a whole branch of batteries. And if you look at the literature, the number of different kinds of batteries are sort of increasing as we speak because there is a lot of science coming into this area. So. It, I've forgotten some, I know, but it, it just shows you how many different materials there are. And I'm pointing out lithium-ion battery. I should po probably point out the lead acid, because if you look at the sales, 50% of all the sales today are lithium-ion. The rest is lead acid. But uh, sodium-ion batteries are coming up, and uh, solid-state batteries were mentioned this earlier, something coming along the way. And then, when, of course, we come to this, that we have the critical raw materials. And this is something that is changing every year. If you look at the European list of critical elements, there are things added almost as we speak. Natural graphite, bauxite for, for aluminium, titanium uh, metal, beryllium, I think, you, and some of them becoming red, etc. So it, it, it's a movable target. And of course, for batteries, having this prospect with all these gigafactories coming up, this is a one-year-old picture, so there are already new dots that could be added to this picture. But there are also dots that we could remove from this picture, because some of them have already failed. But it's, um, it is a, a um, quite interesting map, I think. In the Nordic countries, we talk about our Nordic battery belt. Sweden, Finland, and, and Norway, because we have a lot of in common here for, for when it comes to battery materials and manufacturing of, of uh, cells. You see also a clustering here in, the, uh, in Germany and uh, north, of, north of France, a lot of things going on. But you see a big clustering here was in Eastern Europe, which I find is quite interesting. Here you find the Asian industry coming in, they are not building so much connections to higher education 
and universities, academia, they are not having any good links there. These links are good in the Nordic countries, it's good in this area here too. So, but look at Poland, where you have the largest factory for batteries in, in the world, the LG one from Korea. Uh, the export uh, from Poland now, 2% is based on batteries. It's, it's, I mean, you, it's visible in your statistics. Combining this map then with a map of activities uh, in the battery materials sector, raw active materials and recycling, you see again that the Nordic region is very strong. It's here we find natural graphite, like in Sweden and Norway. We find even lithium here, cobalt we have in Sweden. We have cobalt even more in, 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 uh, in Finland where we have green electricity. But you find also a lot of activities here in, in Germany and of course Spain, Portugal, etc. So it's, it's uh, interesting. And, you know, materials and complex, and I can feel like being a, go a great uh, old uh, grumpy lady, um, being now almost 40 years in the battery research field, that we are looking at the same materials all, all over again and again. And we are doing different synthesis techniques, we are doping it, we have surface coating it, and so on. But we need to do it because it's complex. Uh, and this is just different kinds of carbons and some uh, different kinds of tubes. Uh, yes, to complement the need for sometimes having nano as well, surface treatments, etc. Uh, and going also to the next step, we can say when you put these, combine these materials, batteries are complex, and this is actually the only slide you will see from my own research, where we look a lot at the interfaces of batteries, and you can see if you have some uh, classical electrolyte, you have actually a crosstalk of components so what's happening here during a electrochemical, uh, when you're cycling or recycling your battery, will actually uh, spread and, and react on the surface on the negative electrode. And if you want to uh, uh, avoid this crosstalk, you can have different additives, you can have different uh, scavengers, you have chemistries to remo remove some components. And it's very clear that th the industry knows this. And in a battery today, you have maybe more than 20 different components in the electrolyte between the electrodes to handle this kind of crosstalks. But this is something we need to learn also at the research date when we want to move to new chemistries, the calcium, aluminium, and the ones that can give us a lot in the future, but uh, that where we really need to learn and understand more. So going down to the ambitions in, in uh, in uh, the European landscape. What do we want to do long-term research? Well, we have talked about that already. We need speed, we need to accelerate. So uh, we have in the battery 2030 plus a motto, reinventing the way we invent the batteries of the future. And of course, we want to provide breakthrough technologies. We want to enable European leadership. And we have focused on ultra high performance batteries, batteries of the future. And that is because we didn't want to take too much time on the mature chemistries already on the market. We're also talking about smart functionalities. Very important when you have these new uh, challenges chemistries where, the, where you have the crosstalk uh, really uh, at the heart of what's going on. And of course, sustainability and, uh, and new chemistries are important. We have uh, this is uh, summarized in our roadmap. And we have a number of projects that have to deliver according to this roadmap. And uh, so it's called Inventing the Sustainable Batteries of the Future. So I will give you a few examples on how to reinvent the way we invent the batteries of the future. And I will take one example first from our big map project, which is the largest one. It's coordinated by DTU. And it goes back to this, uh, how we have been working science-wise, and maybe also an industry, that we go this linear, we have the linear thinking all the time. So we have, uh, especially on the modeling side, so what I'm describing now is theoretical modeling. How can we accelerate by using the digitalization tools we have today? So we have materials production for modeling, we go to the synthesis, we say yes and no, and go back to the modeling, and then we go to 
the, if we have a successful uh, synthesis, we do material sketchization, we have some uh, modeling, etc., packed level. And then you can have a, a number of problems along this way uh, so that you, you uh, have to uh, rethink your uh, models to build on. So we need to accelerate and transcend the sequential discovery pathway. Uh, and uh, by doing that, you can use the combination of modeling tools and experiment. Or experiment. So this is what we call the multiscale ladder. You look very carefully at the atoms and molecules you have. It requires a lot of uh, computational efforts. You go to a more sort of systems perspective because you get more of molecules and so on. And you have to use other kinds of tools, modeling tools and algorithms. And the difficulty is uh, between these steps. When you go from the really small to build larger and larger and more realistic things, that the systems get larger and larger and more difficult to describe, which means that you, you, have, uh, you need to develop new algorithms in these uh, interface uh, regions. So that is what is done here in this big map project. So uh, it, it's, um, it's a, an advanced bridging of scales, but existing software and hardware is too slow. That's today. So we, we are starting to need a quantum computer. So therefore we have a dialogue today with um, the quantum technology flagship where they are trying to, uh, to build uh, a quantum uh, computers because a new quantum battery simulation paradigm for multi-scale battery modeling would actually give us better tools uh, to, to handle this. Uh, and uh, since this is a little bit beyond the reach uh, of existing hard and software tools, we have to leave what we have. So uh, to combine this, we now go for artificial intelligence, machine learning, to really have uh, a good way of seeing what we are doing. Because you know, if you look at many materials, have a big mat matrix, you look at many materials, and you look at a lot of combination of these materials, you generate a lot of data. And you also characterize what's happening. And since we are here in Lund, I just must tell you about one initiative in the Big Map project that might, if anyone here is interested in battery research, actually pay the way and open it for any of you. Because one of the goals that we have is that we should share our algorithm, we should share our knowledge with the community. Uh, we should animate the battery research in Europe, if I should. Uh, uh, cite the director of the flag of the partnership and this is an example uh, of uh, what uh, you can do if you have the access to neutron and, and synchrotron facilities you can build multi-model and correlate correlative characterization workflows and a company it's a rather complex uh, slide so I will just point out here you have BASF working at ESRF, looking at a lot of, screening a lot of battery materials, especially positive electromaterials, with diffraction methods, really uh, uh, with robotic screening, full, full, full time speed. That is something the scientific community would need too. But we need, uh, and this is just an example, how you could learn from using both X-rays and neutrons that you have one kind of of uh, rearrangement of uh, your atoms when lithium enter the graphene, uh, the graphene layers in graphite and when it, you are taking it out. You have heterogeneous uh, reaction there. Um, so you generate a lot of data and we want to have access to that as scientists as well. So, we are so at the SRF, there is building of a hub now that hopefully for this community can be a hub with a better access and faster access program. And that's something we would like to know, want to do and share at the more European level also. So it's now a suggestion in the strategic agenda for the next roadmap for, for uh, Europe that will be taken quite soon. Um, and uh, by doing that, we also have a lot of organizations working on a number of tools, operando tools, that should be available for the community. 
and, and for this animation of the uh, workflow. But it's also so that we generate a lot of data from these different uh, partners and with these different tools to feed into the modeling so that we ha they have a lot of enough models, um, data to build a new algorithm on and they can use artificial intelligence and so on. So um, by, by doing that, for all these different techniques, we are using standards and protocols, electronic notebooks. We must know what we are, uh, what we are measuring and how we are doing it. And we have uh, set up fair data on the same samples, and then we, it's available. And when you do that, you realize that you need a battery ontology, you need a workflow. And really to tell for a battery, there are different steps. Uh, where do you have the data? What is the raw material? How, have it, how has it been synthesized? How have you mixed it? How had you made your electrode? What is that containing? How do you coat it, etc., etc. And you need to define the different KPIs and also the different kinds of um, key control characteristics for each of these points. And if you do that properly for everything or making a battery from raw materials, adding, adding electrolytes all to the full cell, you get actually a quite unhandable situation. So that means that you also need to, to do this in a way that you can see and understand it. And that's really important. So now this is sort of extremely important because this will influence how we publish in the future. It will influence the uh, protocols that will be put up of the European Commission, etc. I just want to say a few words also on the other part that uh, is important for this uh, battery 2030 plus, and that's smart battery functionalities. And here we have uh, five different projects working on, on the first three ones on, uh, on censoring techniques and three on something we call self-healing. And this is a messy slide. I haven't done it myself, but it's so much they want to tell because they are coming to the end of the project. But this project, Instabat, they're working on making a lab on the chip with physical sensors, optical fibers, some reference electrodes, photoacoustics, etc. And then they have virtual sensors. They want to see what is really happening inside the battery cell when you charge and discharge it. What side, unwanted side reactions to have? How do things build up? Do you get unwanted layers built up that you, you have a resistance in your cell, et cetera. And they're starting to make, uh, make progress uh, on that so they can take it all the way to, to a, a, um, a battery management system at the system level. But they want to know more about the state of the health of the battery. So see if we can last longer. The, um, now we are a bit shy here because the coordinator for Spartacus in the, is in the audience, so I hope you, I make you justice. <laughs> this is the Spartacus project. It's coordinated by Fraunhofer. And here they have a non-invasive sensor. You want to know a lot about the same things, but going from the outside, not putting anything inside by acoustic methods to see in, the, in different parts of this cell how, how you can do it. You are also here, you have temperature sensors, and, and you, you can measure geometrical changes and uh, also some uh, electrochemical behaviors uh, uh, by this building up unwanted uh, layers that can give you a, a, a short, uh, more difficult transport uh, of the charge within the battery. And the third one, uh, building another kinds of integrated sensors it's called Sensibat, it's coordinated by Ikelan in Spain. And uh, they have built like a whole grid here where they put into the battery and see, can we do this without the battery is influenced by it? And they, so they are testing a lot the instability of their sensors, even if the sensors are trying to probe the same thing or similar things like the two previous examples. So this was just a snapshot of very a lot of data coming out from this. 
And uh, when it comes to uh, the self-healing part, it's quite fun because it's a lot of nanomaterials. If you want to put something that can make your battery last longer, you, you can do it by putting something in your electrolyte or you can put a, a surface cover on your electrode, etc. And here are different examples of that. You can do it by, by encapsulating your particles in a binder that binds them together to an electrode uh, and that you can do with if, and <laughs> hydrogen bonding molecules or cross-linking gel, gels, etc. You can also do it with ionic cross-linking, you can have got guest host guest interactions or met metal ligand coordination. It's a, and you can also play with this that we can learn from other fields because I think self-healing has been lot, a long time a, a research field within the paint industry, for instance. And it's also, we can learn from the field of medicine, drug delivery. Can we have something encapsulated that kicks out when, uh, when we have a stimulus from a sensor, for instance? Uh, so you can play with this, and, and there's a lot of things going on. And the Bat Forever project have actually been able to optimize the self-healing polymer binder, which, it, which can handle uh, a silicon electrode. And a silicon electrode is something the battery field really would like to have because if you could have more of silicon in your negative electrode, then you could have higher uh, energy content directly in your lithium ion battery cell. So it's an, in one way an incremental change, but it can be an incremental change by, by a disruptive thing. We have many, many different EO projects working on this problem now. And the problem is that the silicon, when you have a reaction with lithium, it will expand about 300%. And when you take out the lithium, it contracts. And you can imagine yourself if you have something uh, coated on a current collector, a thin film of, of copper, for instance, that if you if it, uh, have this large volume change, it, it might crack and it, 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 it's, uh, it's, it, it's quite tough to handle. So the idea is that you have this um, binder which can break instead of a particle, uh, but reshape again. And uh, so this is their strategy, and I think they have managed to have that. And I'm still looking forward to the mechanism for how this polymer is working. So that's in the next step. The hidden project is working on two uh, ways of doing it. Having uh, liquid crystals in their electrolyte that should be hard. And when you cycle it with a lithium metal that can grow fingers out, uh, in uh, like gray uh, dendrites and destroy your battery, they should be hard enough to, to break that. It's just that the ionic conductivity is still far too low for that. But their other uh, work is on a um, uh, separator where you uh, have your liquid electrolyte in and that you can make redox active as well. And that redox activity has shown to be very, very much more a, a promising route for, for actually self-healing. So by these examples, I just wanted to show you that uh, acceleration and animation of the battery landscape. I hope for those who you are interested in more details that you and uh, to do things yourself that this uh, work we are doing in the synchrotrons in Europe, trying to open up for some kind of hubs where we can have access in a much uh, more community-driven way than today will be a model that can be helpful for many, many groups in Europe. It's starting at the SRF now, but I know that the other, universe, the other synchrotrons are just as interested in this dialogue and having this dialogue as we speak. So, um, and if you want to learn more, you can see and download things from our webpage. And thank you for listening. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Christina. So, uh, uh, <laughs> the presentation is open for a couple of questions. So, let's see. Yes.
I, I don't think these methods today are there. Uh, I think the kind of sensors that you put uh, in cars, they are more at the system levels. You know, you have like a big park and that these uh, rather tells you that, uh oh, it's, it's uh, uh, not too late, but if you don't behave soon, it can be too late. <laughs> uh, I, I know that uh, the uh, automotive industry is a little bit skeptical to put uh, a sensor in each cell. So uh, I think this is really long-term research. And what we learn, the, the group that is more interested in this kind of techniques are actually the recycling industry, where they want to know from each cell what, what's going on here. Because it can be, if you have a pack of 1,000 batteries, it might be 20 that are really wrong, <laughs> and then you can use the rest. Um, so uh, it will, I, I don't think it will today give you so much longer life, but it will tell you when the life is ending. I think the self-healing concept is more promising for that. So the combination, which is our new project, starting now. So I can put up six new projects here, starting the free art to start combining these two. Then it might be actually something that can boost your interest also in the future. I will allow one more question as I know Christina is uh, leaving straight after the session, so if there's anyone more. Yes. Uh, that, that is something um, we have not in this program taken into account the redox flow batteries yet, but that is definitely something that's coming the next phase, starting 1st of September. But I th because I think it's, it's a very interesting area and it's, it's sort of growing in importance because it, so far this has been driven so much by the automotive industry and now we see that the old utility companies and the large scale, the stationary tour is, is coming in and it's much more interesting. Uh, I think that if you look at some of the um, mature flow batteries, like the vanadium-based, they've been along. Uh, uh, they have been here for quite on the sort of prototype level for quite a long time. But there are new concepts coming in that I think will be very interesting to test these um, um, methods on. So we have actually suggest just some, uh, some future EU calls that we hope can go through that can actually be uh, for the modeling part, for that part uh, of uh, batteries too, because this is coupled energy and, and power. And, and if you have a flow cell, you have decoupled energy and power. So it means a little bit different thing, way of thinking about the modeling. But the same kind of, um, material acceleration platform interface and acceleration should be done on the flow cells. So I hope it's, I hope the industry will like it and will uh, uh, support that new EU call. <laughs> so uh, don't know yet. With, with that cue, I think we're sort of hinting <laughs> at the uh, industry's next step. So yeah. thanks a lot, Christina. Give her a bit of hands again.